Hi everyone and welcome back to iRebel on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, we've been on vacation for a while, um, but we hope to get back to our regular scheduled programming uh, with this episode starting off. Um, so this one's going to be a little bit different tonight. Uh, usually we're kind of formal with it and this time we're, we've actually got an article for you, another, <laughs> another uh, frustratingly misinformed um, anti-libertarian article um, but they're fun to read and so we're gonna read it we're gonna go through it and we're just gonna give our sort of natural reaction to it we've we've both read it uh, pretty much just once over and uh, so we're gonna go through it and tell you what we think and tell you where they're wrong so, um, and that sort of thing um, and so this article it's, let's see, it was from The Guardian, actually, which is kind of disappointing. Um, and it's called, Libertarian Ideology is the Natural Enemy of Science. So that's really fun. Um, and so just really quick, uh, we call ourselves voluntarists, and we are. And you could also call us libertarian anarchists, and you could also call us uh, just anarcho-capitalists sometimes um, there are different ways to say it but this is sort of address uh, it's addressing libertarian ideology and uh, you know Sarah and I consider ourselves libertarians um, so that's what we're gonna that's the word we're using tonight um, so I don't know <laughs> I think you had something to say about this title actually right off the bat yeah I do um, I was thinking that I don't even agree. I, I mean, of course, I don't agree with that. That we are the enemy of science. That we reject science. What we actually reject is the initiation of the use of force. So it's sort of like comparing apples to oranges throughout this whole thing. And you know, we'll address that with each of his points. But that's really the focus. It's not that libertarians reject science. Absolutely, we don't. But we certainly aren't going to um, use the initiation of the use of force to change things that we don't, that we think are are bad or I don't know. It's not it's not a rejection of science. It's just absolutely no, not. No, absolutely not. Right. Okay, so should we start in with reading yeah. it? Let's dig in. So it starts off with. The observation that science and politics makes uneasy and often treacherous bedfellows is hardly relevatory. In science, all hypothesis must withstand the trial by fire of experiment. Its methodology is self-correcting and objective, unconcerned with petty prejudices or personal conviction. Politics, by contrast, is deeply entangled with ideology. It is not bound to respect reality as science is and thinks nothing of substituting convincing evidence for emotive rhetoric. And yet, when science and politics clash, it is all too often the science that loses. This is clearly seen in clashes between scientific evidence and economic liberalism, which is defined by the belief that economies should be founded along individualist lines, with minimal government regulation, strong support for the free market, and private property rights are identifying features. This later axiom of faith states that the, those who have obtained property are free to exploit it as they desire. With no obligation to others. With, with property without consent, often even taxation is considered an infringement. With some variation, these principles form the basic the basis of the political philosophy of many organizations, think tanks, and even political parties, such as the Libertarian Party and Tea Party in the United States and Australia's ruling Liberal Party. Yet often these fiercely individualist and regulation-adverse philosophies clash with science with hugely detrimental consequences. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I totally agree with the first paragraph. Um, I do about, too. Yeah, that that one I had no problem with. Um, I did have a problem with. Uh, so, <laughs> this this phrase "axiom of faith," and you know, we, you and I were talking about this earlier. That really actually doesn't mean anything. Um, 
axiom is not faith. It, it's uh, it's a point of reasoning. So that's a completely mm -hmm. different thing there. I think it's, it right. doesn't understand what axiom means, honestly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's a completely gross misunderstanding of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. um, and pr yeah, property rights are not an axiom of faith. No, <laughs> there, it, right? It, it, it's an axiom of reasoning. So um, yeah. while you can have uh, faith that has a starting point, axiom just means starting point. So a starting mm -hmm. point of reasoning. So you can have an uh, a starting point of faith, but that's faith that's a belief not reasoning lot you know logic right. and completely different so I think he's actually uh, poisoning the well with that one a little bit and I mm -hmm. actually saw something else that was poisoning oh yeah exploitation the use of the word exploitation well um, let me see where did he write that uh, oh free to exploit it as they desire so he says uh, those who have obtained property are free to exploit it as they desire with no obligation to others and that's just so untrue. Mm -mm, right. Um, There's nothing about libertarianism that advocates or allows for the exploitation of property if it harms others. Right, I mean that's you so if we take off that word exploit which he obviously used as an insult and mm -hmm. replace it with a word use so it would say uh, those that have obtained property are free to use it as they desire um, but they do have an obligation to, to others they can use it so long as, as they desire so long as it's not infringing on another person's rights it's not hurting them in any way so yes. that's disingenuous um, to say that it has no obligation to others right there is is the main problem with this entire article um, mm -hmm. so you know when he says this right is considered absolute and anything that would interfere with the property without consent even taxation and yeah I mean taxation is uh, exploitative um, it's considered an infringement because taxation is theft I mean if theft isn't an infringement on your property I don't know what is so um, mm -hmm. you know that's that's what yeah. I wanted to say about that yes yes and you know the property right and I noticed sorry, he like oh no you go ahead um, just the property rights again they're not an axiom of faith but they're a starting point on which everything else is built so if one does not own themselves then who owns them and if I do not have the right to myself how do I give another the right to me so libertarians start with the non-aggression axiom as a logical proof for property rights collectivism has no such proof it's a belief that the common good trumps the individual so if you want to talk about what is a faith <laughs> Right, an act of faith. Um, that would be it, it. That would be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, just really quick. Uh, I love how here he links the Libertarian Party and the Tea Party, and I've noticed lots of these articles like this. Uh, you know, I, I guess I I should take this particular article individually. However, there have been a lot of them lately, and they all try and link. Uh, libertarian with uh, conservative and or Republican um, so libertarian party is just Republican light or something like that <laughs> and uh, they just keep like beating this horse and it's not true libertarians are not Republicans and they're not conservatives and they're I mean some may have socially conservative beliefs on their own but that really doesn't have anything to do with their libertarian ideology um, and a lot of them don't right like, right you know, socially, I'm liberal. So, uh, it this this is again. I mean, he keeps poisoning the well like over and over. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted and, to point and, that and, out. And back to initially, what we said is that libertarians are against the the initiation of the use of force. So, I'm gonna just say collectivists or status statists talking about you know obviously the political views of the author of this. Um, although we don't know exactly what his views are, but clearly he thinks that it's perfectly fine to interfere with others' 
with another's property without consent if it's done in the name of some fictional make-believe common good. Right. Yeah. And I think he actually talks about that, but we'll see. We'll yeah. need some more. So, mm -hmm. it goes on. Climate change illustrates this well, because despite overwhelming evidence of anthropogenic influence, there is a tendency for those with pronounced free market views to reject the reality of global warming. The reason underpinning this is transparent. If one accepts human-mediated climate change, then supporting mitigating action should follow. But the demon of regulation is a bridge too far for many libertarians. Given that climate change affects everyone, whether they consent to it or not, then unregulated use of natural resources infringes the property rights of others and is ideologically equivalent to trespass, so the tenuous property rights house of cards comes crashing down. Um, I, <laughs> I'm going to stop there really quick. <laughs> so, first of all... Um, if there is a tendency for those with free market views to reject the reality of global warming, that has nothing to do with their libertarianism. Libertarianism has nothing to say about global warming. Nothing. Um, some believe that it's true and some believe that it's not and lots of people just you know are mature enough to admit they don't know <laughs> and so it has nothing to say and just because some libertarians may say that they don't believe in in uh, man-made global warming doesn't mean that that has anything to do with libertarianism um, so that's really uh, lame <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. so and then to <laughs> To use property rights to say, I mean, this is this is so backwards. <laughs> does this guy or does he not believe in property rights? I mean, and no. it, I guess so. If he doesn't believe in property rights, then why is he using the infringement on property rights to say that global warming is bad? Right. So. Right. Well, he's trying to use our terms to argue against us, but really, then what he's saying is like that that this infringement comes on upon us through nature, like some kind of weird, out-of-this-world force, right? I mean, it yeah. just, who's infringing? So climate change is infringing on us? Right. Uh, well, if it's... And, I mean, this, this whole thing boils down to what he says right here. The demon of regulation is a bridge too far for many libertarians. Again, that's not true. It's only state regulation that libertarians mm -hmm. aren't are, are against, and that's because the state uses initiatory force to get what it wants. Right. So, mm -hmm. so libertarians are cool with any kind of regulation that the private sector can come up with, as long as it's not based on the initiation of force. And there are plenty of ways to regulate everything through the private. Uh, sector. Yeah. And we don't even you know. know. We don't even know all the ways that they're right. Could be. Uh, and yeah, so it is so untrue that uh, that libertarians are uh, uh, think that regulation is a demon and it's a bridge too far. That's it's just mm -hmm. mixing up the state with it. just because something needs to be done doesn't mean the state needs to do it. Right. It doesn't mean the state should do it. And and just because we say we don't want the state to do it doesn't mean we don't want it done. So right. that's that is also a misunderstanding and a very common one actually of libertarian yeah. ideology. Um that's And and there would be there is no right to infringe if 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 using your property infringes on other people, then that would be against libertarian ideology. It just that wouldn't be okay under the non-aggression principle. Right. So, uh, I mean, the the goal is to figure out how to solve the problems without using force. That's it. Yes. That's win-win. Mm -hmm. right. And if if 
you are a person who believes that climate change, man-made climate change, is a problem. That's fine. Mm -hmm. right? You can believe that and be a libertarian. You just mm -hmm. have to say, okay, well, we need to fix this problem without using force. That's it. So mm -hmm. this this has nothing to do with crashing down property rights. <laughs> um, yeah. And well, I can yeah. keep going, but uh, let me... Uh, yeah, let's finish, and then we can say more about this yeah. particular issue. So, when faced with this ideological dilemma, free market advocates often resolve the cognitive dissonance by simply rejecting the reality of climate change, like we just did, <laughs> rather than acknowledging that their axiom is fundamentally flawed. Okay, the axiom isn't mm -hmm. fundamentally flawed, and... That's not true that we simply reject the reality of climate change. It's, again, I mean, we just went through this, but, this, mm -hmm. and cognitive dissonance. Or, so. Well, and let's just say that we're not so married to the rejecting of it or to the claiming of it that we can't read something or consider a view that doesn't go along with what the majority believes. I mean, if anything, I think libertarians, at least the ones that I know, are much more likely to take a look at science that might come out, new science, new information that would would be, you know, that would say that yes, it is a problem, or no, it's not a problem. Absolutely, yeah, I I agree. I mean, it, you have to have some sort of in order to be a libertarian in the first place, unless you were raised that way, I suppose. Um, you have to have sort of an ability to see past or get over cognitive dissonance and cognitive bias. So I feel like libertarians have more of a chance to set aside uh, you know what they think they know mm -hmm. to actually objectively look at you know facts and opinions or whatever they're seeing. Right. Data. Because we're not married to one side of the aisle or the other as far as the solution or who's going to benefit from the solution. Right. Or be hurt from the solution. It would be, you know, a market solution. Right. Oh, and this is something I wanted to do really quick in this because it keeps talking about the free market. And mm -hmm. I hear there are a lot of misconceptions about what the free market is. Um, and so just to define it really quick for everybody, uh, the free market is everybody in the world interacting and trading with everybody else in the world. It's, it's you and me and the neighbors and everyone we know trading with everyone else we know. So, and even voluntarily. if you're voluntarily, and even if you're not actually trading, like say you're 10, <laughs> you're still part <laughs> of the free market mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, people are trading on your behalf and things are being made there. You have demands mm -hmm. um, that are being catered to by other people mm -hmm. working within the free market. So I just define the free market as everybody in the whole world. That's I love that. And and also just that it's another really good imp a really important point with um, free trade and free market is that trade is always made of win, mm -hmm. so both parties will walk away better off than they were before the trade or the trade would not happen. Right, unless it's not voluntary, which wouldn't make it a trade. But right, right. Mm -hmm. But in the free market, in the voluntary free market, trade yeah. is made of win. I love that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do too. <laughs> so, um, it goes on. I explored ideologically driven reasoning in a previous blog. Rejection of science seriously impedes climate action, and denial is endemic in American economic liberal sets. With the Tea Party being the worst offenders. Well, it's a good thing we're not the Tea Party then. Mm -hmm. So, last year, when it snowed in Alaska in May, Sarah Palin exclaimed, Global warming my gluteus maximus. Despite the fact that paradoxical cold snaps are predicted by climate change models and do not contradict the finding that average global temperature continues to soar, a libertarian politician Ron Paul dismisses climate change as a hoax. Okay. Is that true? <laughs> Even, uh... We'll Maybe. have to look that up. I don't know. He could, but it's if, sourced here. 
So he probably said something yeah. like that. But if he did, that's his personal opinion, not... And probably more what he meant was, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, we can look into it, but that it's, it's highly beneficial to be on the side of global warming as far as academics and grant money and environmental money. So maybe in that sense, he might have been speaking to that. Right. Like it's I'm, I guess I have heard him say stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's definitely monetarily beneficial if your grant is going to study global warming. Well, yeah, definitely. And you can see it with all these pushes, like in this article, um, the way he's talking about it, mm -hmm. like we, we must fix this, you know, meaning the state, climate action. He's talking climate action. about mm -hmm. the state doing something, whatever the state would do. And I've heard proposals from the state, and they don't sound very fixy to me. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I, Right, and and I just want to add, I don't like his language. Soar continues to soar. Yeah, and that's that's just what is that? You know, you're using these um, it's visual words. Mm -hmm. Sort of leading, I guess. I don't know mm -hmm. what that would be called, but also, uh, well, I guess he talks about the Tea Party, but again, with the linking Tea Party with libertarians, they are two mm -hmm. different things. If Tea right. Partiers were libertarians, they would be libertarians, and the other way around, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. There's yeah. nothing libertarian about Sarah Palin. Not at all. Yeah. And even if Ron Paul considers himself a libertarian, he runs under the Republican Party when he mm -hmm. runs for office, so... Yeah, but either one of them, say Sarah Palin was a libertarian. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't really, it, again, her her opinion on global warming has nothing to do with libertarian ideology. That's Sorry. right. You know, and neither does Ron Paul's opinion on global warming. It's not. That's right. Uh, but libertarians I think, might be more likely to feel like they can be outspoken about how they do feel based mm -hmm. on the science that they've read. Right, but I mean, I think everyone is. I don't know. The most outspoken people I see uh, talking about global warming are liberals, honestly, or progressives. Mm -hmm. um, so Yeah, I guess I see it on both sides. And I also see um, it done in such a way that I, I often wonder, well, what if you did find out that you, whatever your view was, it was actually the other way? Yeah. You know, it's sort of like when you back a political candidate and then you just you have to get behind them and you have to defend everything that they do right right so I, I guess this uh, this goes back to what we were saying before is it's ideas not people so it's just got to be careful and you, like this mm -hmm. I mean he's purposefully linking people to ideology and I don't right. know if he I don't know if he's being uh, disingenuous or he really does think this way but this is some kind of fallacy or you know it, it, it yeah it's the genetic fallacy actually that's right what it would, um, called but it's saying that because this person says this then you know all the rest of it is wrong um, which is you know faulty reasoning <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and we can go on. He, he continues, of course, the assertion that climate change is a myth is not a solely American phenomenon. Tony Abbott decreed climate change as absolute crap. Earlier this year, he struck down the already limited carbon tax introduced to mitigate the damage, despite clear evidence that Australian average temperatures continue to rocket skyward. Well, there's your fixie solution, Meredith. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Carbon tax. And I pulled up the Wikipedia page on free market environmentalism just to read a little bit of what that view is um, to give people kind of an understanding. Um, it is the political position that argues that the free market, property rights, and tort law provide the best means of preserving the environment, internalizing pollution costs, and conserving resources. When environmental problems may be viewed as market failures, free market environmentalists argue that environmental problems arise because the state encodes, provides, and enforces laws which override or obscure property rights and thus fail to protect them adequately. 
and to laws governing class or individual tort claims provide polluters with immunity from tort claims or interfere with those claims in such a way as to make it difficult to legally sustain them. Free market environmentalists therefore argue that the best way to protect the environment is to use tort and contract laws governing and protecting property rights and tort claims to protect the environment. They believe that if affected parties can compel polluters to compensate them, they will reduce or eliminate the externality. Market proponents advocate changes to the legal system that empower affected parties to obtain such compensation. They further claim that governments have limited affected party's ability to do so by complicating the tort system to benefit producers over others. So it's sort of like um, a good example of this is when there was the big oil spill mm -hmm. and BP was only responsible for a certain amount of the cleanup because that had been decided well before any spill. And the government had to foot the bill for the rest of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in a free market that wouldn't happen. No, I mean, basically what it's saying is if somebody does something that's criminal, hold them accountable. And that will uh, mm -hmm. take care of a lot of these environmental problems. Mm -hmm. Because if you're polluting on somebody's land, well, that's somebody's land. That's a crime. And if you mm -hmm. are, you know, any kind of, I mean, there are tons of things that, that one person or company could do to another person or company. Um, but right now, it's sort of all blanketed by the state, it all goes through this middleman that is the state that decides either beforehand or after what they're going to do, if anything. Mm -hmm. So a, a carbon tax, that's really going to help, you know, that. so their solution is carbon tax instead of just, you know, being an actual system of justice. <laughs> We're right, not gonna... and then that's just another way for corporate war warfare to happen, too. Mm -hmm. You know, one... Oh, yeah. Party to lobby for you know their laws that they like to hurt the people that they're in competition with. Mm -hmm. It's using the gun that is the state, right? Yeah. Which is what libertarianism is against. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> not science. Once right. again, not science. Yes. So he goes on um, to address another issue. The individualist anti-regulation stance of free market advocates also has serious consequences for health care. As economist Paul Krugman explains in a recent column, disciples of Milton Friedman remain deeply opposed to the very concept of the U.S. Federal Drug Administration, viewing it as a needless intrusion by government. In Friedman's opinion, without the FDA, corporations would be kept from hurting people by fear of lawsuits and thus self-regulate. The truth is that without external evaluation, it is difficult to work out the effic efficacy or side effects of any drug. Ben Goodacre's book, Bad Pharma, illustrates with copious detail that when pharmaceutical companies are obliged to do clinical trials, they are often reported in statistically devious, cherry-picked, and wholly dishonest ways to overstate their treatment's effectiveness. So let's just stop there for a minute because... Mm -hmm. What he's using as his example is a book about the current pharmaceutical industry, which is regulated by the FDA. I mean, we don't have this magical free market um, pharmaceutical industry right now. So here he's, he's arguing against advocating that using an example of, of, of effects that have happened because of what we have right now, I, which is an FDA. Right. I, I actually I caught that too. What is he trying to say? I mean, he's saying basically right now uh, <laughs> that they are often reported uh, in statistically devious, cherry-picked, and wholly dishonest ways. So, I mean, it, it's regulated like crazy, and this yeah. is the result. Uh, so I, I'm not sure, yeah, what he's trying to... We don't have the free market with health care in healthcare, so no. I don't know what he's trying to say. And so I guess if the FDA allows companies to do their own trials, which they do, I guess, um, and then they get approved, the company's off the hook to some degree, I'm sure, because they're FDA approved. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, so so yeah, sorry, all you have to do is invalid. Mm -hmm. 
So we can go on here. This is unsurprising given the incentive of private company of a private company is to maximize profit. With scientific integrity comes a distant second. The expectation that private companies can be trusted to innovate healthcare is also misguided. While antibiotic resistance has been steadily increasing, for example, practically no new antibiotics have been developed in decades. Okay, once again, under this current system. Not some magical free market. And this this happens a lot. Like people will look to the the private side of business versus the government mm -hmm. and say that um, you know, this is what would happen in a free market. Just look, look what these corporations are doing. But these corporations are existing of, under a government. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so this, that's, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. How can he say this is against libertarian ideology when it has nothing to do with libertarian ideology? It's not free market. This is going mm -hmm. on right now. And so, like, uh, and you and I are excited to see what would happen if uh, these areas of of I don't know yeah. uh, business are set free, and and then they can compete, and then they can mm -hmm. come up with new antibiotics, and then they can fix these problems again without force. Right now, he's going to go on to tell us why. This hasn't happened. Why no new antibiotics have been developed? Um, and before he does, I would just like to point out that um, in order to run trials, in order to even begin the process of testing a new drug, you, you, it's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or millions of dollars, right? I mean, I actually am not sure of the exact cost, but it's extremely high for a company to put a new drug through for testing. Um, because of the regulations that they have to jump through. Mm -hmm. So he's going to go on to argue a major reason for this is that despite the massive impact of antibiotics on mortality rates in the past century they remain a low profit product typically used by a patient for only a short time. It is far more profitable to develop long-term medication for chronic conditions and Surprisingly, this is what drug companies prefer to do. So, of course, but, you know, there's always going to be somebody that if they could afford to develop an inexpensive antibiotic that you're only going to use a couple times a month, somebody would. I mean, people make Band-Aids. People make... Oh. There are companies that make all kinds of things that we use for short times that aren't super expensive or profitable. Yeah, well, and he's saying there's a, there's this problem with its antibiotic resistance. Yeah. So there's no incentive to make a, a new antibiotic, but of course there's incentive because at some point soon, the antibiotics that are on the market are not going to work. They're not going to make any profit of them whatsoever. So they have to create uh, a different type of antibiotic. Otherwise, they're not going to get a damn thing. So right. In, in the free market or under a free market system, that would just that would happen faster and right. uh, you know more and, often. And if his premise was true, then why would any company make antibiotics at all? Right. Just treat him with something that's not gonna, that's not going to uh, make anyone better. Just sell uh, something that masks the symptoms, and that's it. Because right. you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. This profit thing is. We'll, we'll get into the the whole profit thing, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the logical outcome of entrusting healthcare research to private companies. It also means they can charge extortionate amounts for life-saving medicines. Free market defenders may try to pin the blame on costly and needless regulation for driving up prices, but this argument is somewhat superficial given that they are generally opposed to increased taxation and public spending on medical research, as if that's the only option, okay, which could circumvent this vicious cycle. It also ignores the fact that drug companies spend multiples of their research budget on marketing. Okay. okay, so he's going to say that, you know, we're wrong. What I, Basically what I argued earlier is wrong. It's not that they have to spend so much money on their research and on their um, regulation, but it's, um, you know, but 
and the reason is because if that was true, then why would libertarians be opposed to increased taxation of public spending? As if public spending is the only way that medical research could happen. Yeah, well, again, he's married to the state. He thinks if something has to be done, it can only be done through the state. And he also doesn't say why. Uh, he just says, this is the logical outcome of entrusting healthcare to research to private companies. It also means that they can charge extortionate amounts for life-saving medicines. Why does it mean that? He has he gives no qualifier qualifier for that. Actually, that's the opposite. They can't, ch people don't just make up prices. They have to go by market uh, demand or, or mm -hmm. what the market will can afford to pay for a certain thing. And um, in a free market, especially if you do away with these ridiculous regulations, then you're going to have competition. And the more competition you have, the less you, anybody's going to be able to charge overcharge on anything including medication so what you know I, I, he just sticks that line in there but you know and then just and travels right past it if we were really going to unravel that the price then we'd have to get into insurance too which is a whole other um, issue mm -hmm. right yes because but, the insurance companies help set that price for some of the drugs right yeah, and again, this is all because of state intervention and mm -hmm. in various ways, in lots of ways. So we have no idea what drugs would cost, what, what health care in general would cost under a free market system because we don't have one. So he can't say these things are a problem under free market when it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, it's once again the legal privilege, right? So mm -hmm. all prescription drugs must be approved by the FDA, but again the monopoly privilege of being the sole legal drug dealers in society is only the most obvious one granted the pharmaceutical industry and hardly captures the extent of partnership. So, yeah. I, okay. Um, yeah, and we didn't even talk about the aspirin. Um, which is kind of an interesting little tidbit of information. So um, today, men with risk of heart trouble know to take half an aspirin a day. By 1988, it was well established that aspirin greatly reduces the risk of my my myocardial occlusion. But for years, the FDA forbade aspirin makers from advertising that fact. The FDA still significantly restricts advertising about it. The FDA surely killed tens and quite possibly hundreds of thousands of Americans by this restriction alone. Wow. Yeah, and I also know that it took a long time for um, people to figure out that folic acid prevented the spina bifida, the neural tube defects in women's um, babies because it wasn't pat it wasn't something that could be patented. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't studied. Right. Yeah, uh, and so I mean, this is just one example of. Of you know state intervention, killing people. Honestly, mm -hmm. this is again. We we actually we talked about this in the last show too. We did, yes. About the democide. Democide. Mm -hmm. And it's not just straight out murdering people. That's it's all of these different ways that the government steps in and messes things up, and people end up dying because of it. And this is mm -hmm. what libertarianism is against. Not not global warming. The unintended <laughs> consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Of state right. intervention. Right, because the state is, uh, the foundation of the state is initiatory force. So, and yeah. Okay, <laughs> we'll keep going. Mm -hmm. um, actually, he, he's bringing up another, uh, another issue now. Uh, so he says, another example is gun control. Many American libertarians decree any suggestion that regulation should be tightened, insisting people have the right to arm themselves to make themselves safer. But the statistics show this argument to be nonsensical. Those who carry firearms, even for protection, are much more likely to be shot and increase the risk of death for those around them. These trends have been confirmed time and time again in serious 
epidemiological studies, yet despite the very act of carrying, risking the safety of others, the ideological position of individual rights trumps the facts for a sizable contingent of the U.S. population. Uh, should we pick that yeah. apart? Okay. Sure, good. <laughs> um, well, go ahead with <laughs> what you were going to say. <laughs> So, uh, we did a whole show about gun control. Um, I think it was our last full show that we did, if I'm not mistaken. And we'll put a link to that in the bottom. But um, we certainly found studies that actually said just the opposite of what the studies that he's pointing to say. Right. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult to get a good idea of um, of any of these studies, because you, when you're, we talked about this too, when you're studying a country that has total gun control versus a country like the United States where it differs state to state, you can kind of see patterns because we do have different state laws and regulations, but you can't really study um, the, you know, there's no opposition um, in a state where, in a country where it's completely um, void of any guns. Mm -hmm. Um, so, there, of course, there's studies that, that pretty much cite, you know, one side or the other, but that's not the point of um, libertarians. Uh, it's, it's not that, you know, the act of carrying, what does he say, the, despite the very act of carrying, risking the safety of others, the ideological position of the individual rights trumps the fact for a sizable contingent of the US population. And you know, I guess he's right there that I mean it does trump because and it's it's not even that it trumps the rights it's that you would have to it requires the use of force. It requires the initiation of the use of force to take away those rights from people. Right. And if you're going to right so if you if you outlaw guns and you and you enforce gun control, well, the only way to make sure that people aren't carrying this object or owning this object is to use force to take it away from them. And uh, the ultimate force that we have is guns. So if you're going mm -hmm. to advocate for gun control, not advocating that there are no guns. You're advocating that citizens have no guns. Everybody, right. you know, any any state actor, well not any state actor, but any state enforcer would, mm -hmm. would be carrying a gun, uh, just not regular people and that's not okay. <laughs> so it's not even, you're not even getting rid of guns, you're not, you're just getting rid of some guns from some people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked about this in the last podcast. We talked about a lot of things in our gun control podcast, but um, you're taking away the personal responsibility from people, too, which, you know, is a big part of libertarianism. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I actually I have a lot to say about that, but not right now. Maybe for, yeah. <laughs> for another time. Um and I'm sure I said a lot in the last show, if you guys want to check mm -hmm. that out. <laughs> okay, so I'll keep going. Um, he goes on, All of these problems stem from a clash between ideology and evidence. The ruthlessly individualist philosophy fetishized, fetishized by the modern disciples of Ayn Rand conveniently ignores the fact that humans do not exist in a vacuum and that individual actions often have consequences for all. The mantra that profit is panacea for everything and that personal rights trump collective good is frequently misguided and potentially disastrous. Okay, so first of all, I'm not a disciple of Ayn Rand. And I don't know why they tried out Ayn Rand in all of these articles. You know, I guess in this one we we switched out Sarah Palin for the Koch brothers, so I think that's okay. But <laughs> <laughs> Ayn Rand, it, you know, is just one lady, and she is not. She, was she even a libertarian? I don't even think she was a libertarian. She, uh, maybe. Yeah. I don't even know. She, she's she, an objectivist. She's an objectivist, and the people who follow mm -hmm. her are objectivists. Are objectivists. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Right? It's a completely different thing. Some objectivists are libertarians. Yes. Uh, Yes. But not all of them, and mm -hmm. it's not. I don't know why they keep. I mean, I can guess, but <laughs> that bugs me. Um, I mean, there are some overlaps for sure. Sure, but she doesn't. But mm -hmm. the and especially the way it's put in this article, it's like Ayn Rand came up with libertarianism, which is so and not true. Fetishized. I don't yeah. know what that means. Right. Uh, ruthlessly individualist. Okay, <laughs> I guess we're ruthless, Sarah. Uh, um, so, and humans don't exist in a vacuum, and we know that. That has nothing to do mm -hmm. with libertarian ideology. If you believe that, you know, we, this is this is again with the mixing up. Uh, what do they call it uh, in politics? They always use this one word that I can't think of right now. Um, isolationist, right? Mm -hmm. so, He's equivocating individualist with isolationist, which happens a lot. Yes. Um, just because you are an individualist doesn't mean that you're you don't want friends or you're not happy with your community or you don't believe in community or you don't understand that your cons your actions have consequences. I mean, that's kind of a a tenant <laughs> of libertarianism that that. Yes personal responsibility and that means you know mm -hmm. responsibility for what you do because it has an effect on others and mm -hmm. it draws out these lines um, with these principles self-ownership and property rights that's what they're yeah. for to say when something is justified and when it's not and the time when it's not justified is when it has negative consequences for others so it, yeah, and what he says here when he says um, that the individual actions often have consequences for all, I I don't know. Something doesn't sit right with that with me. Yeah, um, it's not that <laughs> all there are are individuals acting, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and not one individual's actions affect everybody. Yeah, I guess it would be that. It, well, it's a, it's it's sort of spontaneous order. The idea of spontaneous order, but mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. There are only individuals, so of course, individual actions have consequences for all because there are no other types of actions. Um, but it's like he jumps, mm -hmm. you know, from the individual to everybody and in between that is a whole bunch of interacting and spontaneous order right yes I agree so yeah that is a weird thing to say mm -hmm. and it sort of pits it against each other in a way that doesn't make any sense um, and the next sentence is, is the mantra that profit is a panacea for everything okay no nope. um, wrong he didn't even start off saying that. He gave a definition, which is something that lots of people don't do. But he mm -hmm. he did give a definition in the beginning, and he said nothing about profit. Libertarianism says no. nothing about profit. Not even free market interactions say, well, I, I mean, I guess you could put profit in there, but it's not, there is no mantra that says profit is a panacea nope. for everything. That doesn't exist. So, nope. And that it's not about first, profit, but no price is important but not profit right so I mean I think people confuse those two yes well, and I think that, that this is that they like to confuse the two mm -hmm. so, you know, we don't want to be greedy we don't, we don't want to have <laughs> profit which is kind of ridiculous because everybody wants to profit but that <laughs> that's besides the point there's yeah. that that right. doesn't exist. The mantra that profit is a panacea for everything does not exist. And that no. personal rights trump collective good, um, that actually, that's true. Personal rights mm -hmm. do trump collective good. Because what is collective good? If somebody could define collective good for me, that'd be great. So <laughs> I know what personal yeah. rights are. Yeah. Um, but who whose job is it to say, what collective good is? How do you measure collective good? Mm -hmm. That doesn't another. That's right. another thing that doesn't exist. So it, it doesn't exist. And earlier, I really find it interesting that he used uh, 
the word faith and belief so much as far as libertarian ideology, but when you really think about it, it's people that believe in the collective good that need faith and belief and fantasy. Right, because this is an abstract concept, collective good, mm -hmm. that because it actually isn't a thing, it has no definition, anybody who believes in it, it would first of all have to be a belief, and second of all, they could color it whatever way they want, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, getting back to the global warming thing, so somebody who believes in man-made global warming would think that it's a, the collective good to take steps to stop it, and somebody who doesn't believe in man-made global warming would think the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. And you could do that with anything. That is yes. collective good. Yes. And people feel good when they feel like they help the collective good by proxy using the state. Right. But, you know, it it's sad because underneath that is really the violence that is the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I personally believe that it would be good for everyone to uh, be able to earn enough money, let's say, earn enough mm -hmm. to trade for food, to have enough food, right? It would mm -hmm. be good if everyone had enough food and water to satisfy their needs, right? That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how to get there, but I'm certainly not going to use the state to do that. <laughs> I, you know, that would be something that people could work on together uh, and separately to come, to solve this particular problem, but right. not through violence. Right, and you're really solving it person to person in your community. It's very different than when you're just feeling like you are because you have some belief that everyone should have that and you say things, you know, the rhetoric that you say or um, what you say you believe in or you want is very different than actually helping people yes. that you know and that you know need it and are asking for that help. Mm -hmm. Nothing worse than getting help you don't want. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a whole other topic as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I see that often with with people trying to be saviors of people who don't need to be saved, don't need or want right. to be saved. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Okay, so we can keep going. <laughs> uh, so this is not to dismiss the entire political philosophy as bunk. Oh, thank you. Okay. Nor to imply all economic liberals exist in a state of abject denial, but we must be wary of allowing any political ideology to blind us to objective reality. Oh, yes. Spoken like a true Ayn Rand disciple. <laughs> Our individual. <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Our individual rights must be balanced against the rights of others. Uh, which requires a pragmatic interpretation of political philosophies and some softening of extremist outlooks. While we may hold incredibly strong personal convictions, reality doesn't care one iota for what we believe. If we persist in choosing ideology over evidence, this endangers us all. Wow, yeah. Well, right back at you, man. Hey, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the last <laughs> sentence. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm saying, oh. um, yeah. Okay, so should we? And even... all that other wishy-washy, like, so it's all relative. So yeah, we must. Okay, this part I hear this often. So let's address mm -hmm. this really quick. Our individual rights, and I've heard people say this to me, like, mm -hmm. a guy I know, or you know, more than one guy, but you know, not just pundits on TV or people writing. Mm -hmm. articles. They say our individual rights must be balanced against the rights of others, which require, okay, he goes on, which requires a pragmatic interpretation of political philosophies. You have to be practical when you're, yeah. when, and you can't, and you have to soften extremist outlooks. You have to, you have to be balanced and you have to be mm -hmm. moderate and you, you know, you must give up some of your individual rights so that others can be happy. But the thing is, <laughs> it's it's insane because the the whole reason that you wouldn't give up your individual rights in the first place is because that is what balances it. If everybody has 
individual rights intact, that is the balance. So any deviation from that, to any softening of that extremist outlook is going to do the opposite of what this guy is trying mm -hmm. to say. Then we to lose the possibility of the equilibrium that we had talked about in another podcast. Exactly. <laughs> that's what it that's what causes these problems. So you know, pragmatic interpretation of political philosophy. You can just talk about an abstract thing. I mean, that means nothing. That's meaningless. Means nothing. Word, right. what, what, word salad? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> or is that structural violence? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Probably a little of both. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, this this drives me crazy, and I, you know, I've tried to explain this to people who have said this to me in the past, and they just don't understand what I'm saying, which is weird. But that's the reason to uphold, uh, you know, negative individual rights, um, not positive rights, which we can get into in a different time. But but negative rights, that's the reason that they're important because if you don't uphold them throws everything off. It disrupts um, it disrupts rights for whatever group of people that is affected by it. So that's really weird when I hear that. The only way to balance rights is to uphold everyone's individual rights. You can't mm -hmm. soften that outlook. <laughs> softening that outlook. I, and see, using the word softening is just what you were saying too. Like, oh... Right. Yeah. I'm soft and you're extreme. Like mm -hmm. that's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and and also being careful when somebody's using words like our and we. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. what does that really mean? Right. There is no our. I mean mm -hmm. that really confuses people. Mm-hmm. Words mm -hmm. like that are used, and again, the magic—the saying... magic pronouns, right? As Brett Manot from School Sucks says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it does what what I was just saying earlier about people coloring their own interpretations onto these concepts, which I right. happens a lot, and I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure it's purposeful. But it doesn't even matter if it's purposeful or not. You can't separate out truth from fiction. Um, or, you know, something solid from something, you know, not solid <laughs> uh, if you don't know what you're talking about. If you don't, so, like, you, people, all, all, people always think everybody wants the same thing that they want. They think that they are the most reasonable and they have the best solution. And anybody who doesn't think like them is crazy or stupid or, um, you know, needs to learn more, whatever, ignorant, but everybody thinks that. So it's, you know, and they're going to color everything they hear with that particular belief. So if you can use as many words as possible, like we and our and, uh, what did he say here? Um, you know, oh, pragmatic interpretation of political philosophies, all of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. People color what they believe onto them and then argue about it and in, into meaningless arguments that last forever. And you can shape that in any way you want. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, and I'm not sure how this all goes along with him saying that libertarians are against, are the natural enemy of science either. Good because point. he goes from one point, you know, that really we should be like looking at the science of things, and then goes to end it with all of this fluffy, feel good, you know, feelings, um, pragmatic, balancing, mm -hmm. softening, um, choosing, yeah, ideology over evidence. I mean, I guess the last sentence he he, he says that we're we're choosing ideology over evidence, which isn't the fact at all. It, that's, no. That's like a false dichotomy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, that, happily, that was the end of that article. <laughs> um, I'm sure, 
I'm sure there are lots more of things we missed and that we could have said about it. You know, I'm sure there are people thinking, you know, you should have said this and you should have said that. Sure. Leave a comment. Yes. And your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Always love comments. Yeah, we definitely do. And appreciate all everyone that comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> we'll say again, this was a break. We took it on purpose. <laughs> we mm -hmm. are coming back to our regular, uh, you know, weekly show. I don't know about yeah. exact time, but yeah, we should be having a weekly show from this point forward. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for sticking um, with us. On the Voluntary Virtues Network. Mm -hmm. So this has been iRevel, and thanks for tuning in. And Thank we'll see you, you next time. Bye, Meredith. It's always fun. Sure. Always fun, yes. <laughs> Good night. Good night.